we'll, we'll send it out to um, we'll send it out to the campus because it so seems like everyone is busy with their projects, huh? We 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 post them on the under under tech talks on the full stack channel. Um, yeah, even on the front page, you can um, you can go to the I forget what the it's called experience or something like that. Um, all right, so we just want to introduce Mark Stein. Uh, Mark has been a uh, he started out as a C plus plus developer and um, and then about twenty years ago started focusing on the web, right? Um, he's built websites for a lot of um, a lot of famous names, including Bob Dylan and Pearl Jam, and also um, some also some uh, large organizations. And, uh, uh, I'll let Mark introduce uh, introduce those. Um, he's, he's focused a lot on um, how do you build a high quality content driven website, which is actually what the majority of the internet is. Even though we spend a lot of time building games and things like that, like what normal companies spend time thinking about is how do you manage a large information driven website and how do you maintain it over time. Um, and so there are some really cool node based solutions for this that Mark will also talk about and just about that space in general. So um, even though we have a sparse audience, mm -hmm. uh, this talk will uh, hopefully be interesting. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Great. And uh, yeah. OK. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, did, um, who here has, has worked on a CMS, a content management system? You have? OK. What, um, what type? Uh, there's a bunch. Uh, WordPress. WordPress, good. Cool. WordPress is probably the most prevalent. Um, is the sound coming through good? Okay. Um, so I, I have focused on Drupal, which is um, somewhat more sophisticated than WordPress, a, a bit more scalable, um, oriented toward, towards um, more high-end applications. But um, through my, as you said, the last 20 years, um, I've been part of the web industry. My focus has always been on public-facing websites used by human beings. Um, you know, social, um, content-rich, multimedia, and it's it's sort of a different field. You know, often when people are um, techies and they start developing, they want to develop games, they want to develop things that um, look like they would run on on your phone. But really, the types of um, the, the types of engaging experiences that, that really are the bread and butter of the, of the internet really run on CMSs. Um, how do you manage your content? How do you allow users to have various levels of privilege to edit your content? I mean, in a way, Facebook is probably the world's biggest CMS. Um, Facebook certainly is a CMS. Um, it's in that you, as a user of Facebook are a content provider, and you're also a content consumer. So, um, yep. so my, my focus is um, a very big question here. As a person who has first developed CMSs in C++, then I developed C CMSs in Java, then I developed CMSs in PHP, which is what Drupal and WordPress are, um, now I'm very excited about the possibility that the future may be developing CMSs in JavaScript. And from my point of view as a CMS veteran, this is very exciting, a little scary, um, because we, we grow accustomed to our tools. But um, I'm really excited. And the, the title of this is, Is Me in the, the Future of Web Development? Towards the end, I'm going to actually do a comparison of Drupal, which is um, similar to WordPress, a PHP-based CMS, with Keystone, which is um, a node-based CMS. So let's jump in. And definitely ask questions at any point. Um, I, I tried to m make this, um, you know, leave a lot of holes for questions and, and discussions here. So, um, so first, uh, we'll just talk briefly about what the mean stack is. I have a feeling you all know it because you're all here. Um, um, what are the major web industry challenges for 2016? And there are plenty of them. Um, that's th that to me is the, the question that Mean is hopefully the answer for, is these challenges. Why, why is Mean better suited to um, meeting these challenges than, say, PHP or Java or Go or any of these other options? 
And then finally, we'll um, do a case study. We'll, we'll just discuss for a particular CMS operation, would we choose mean, would we choose Node and Angular, or would we choose something more traditional like, like Drupal or WordPress? So here, I'm going to go real quick through this because um, I think you, you know what this is. But basically, a stack is a bundle of software components that work together pr productively. Um, I also like the term ecosystem. I think a, a stack is a, you know, a little, little more of a restrictive word. Ecosystem refers to the stack plus everything else, including the human beings who, who use it. Um, and in the open source world, which is the, the world hopefully that we'll all continue to work in, um, stacks are crucial. We, we couldn't get anything done if we had to, if we didn't know that, say, the Express web server is used with Node and, you know, used with Mongo. So um, it, it helps a lot to have stacks. And um, we're not talking just about software stacks, which could be used to do anything, but we're talking about web development software stacks. So um, the point is that a web development stack helps you build professional HTML5 applications that will run on a computer or on a phone or on any type of device. Um, so, because as you said, I'm, I'm old school here. I've been, I've been doing this forever. For the longest time, my stack was, um, it didn't even, it wasn't called Plaque, Perl, <laughs> Linux, Apache, CGI bin, but that was the stack. And we used that stack for a long time and we hated it. It was real bad. Um, and I, I wonder, do, do people even know the term CGI bin today? <laughs> you do? Okay. CGI bin was basically the, the directory within your web server space that allowed you to throw Perl scripts in. And um, that, that's the old school stack. Um, the Java, Java stack I've also spent my time with. Um, but really, LAMP is the, uh, to me right now, the, the sort of bread and butter of the public facing web. Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. WordPress is LAMP. Drupal is LAMP. Um, Really, most, most of the traditional, you know, commonly used open source applications are, are LAMP. MAMP is when you're developing for LAMP, for a LAMP production web server, but you're developing on your Mac, you'll use MAMP, or you'll use a different Mac um, similar stack. Same with the um, Windows stack, but with Windows, you, you can also be... Um, uh, using the, um, Windows web server, which is IIS, etc., um, the Python stack. And so these are all the stacks that um, have been used. And to me, the most exciting one right now is the mean stack. And I think you all know this. Mongo is the database. Express is the web server. Angular is um, the presentation layer, the client-side framework. And Node, which is really the most important piece here, is the server-side framework. Yeah. Um, you know, that's actually the, the problem with these stacks, is that they don't. They don't integrate the client side. On the client side, you have HTML. Um, yeah, I mean, the client side language is JavaScript. And that, really what you just said is the whole point of this, is that we need a stack that, that gives us back and forth between the client and the server. Okay, so um, this is something I, I say to people who are new to the development industry. Fasten your seatbelts. It's a crazy, crazy industry. Um, you know, as I was writing this, I just started writing these terms. High risk, high reward, high intensity, high turnover, fast rate of change. Because I've been, I've been working in this, you know, making a living, raising my family as a web developer for many years. All of those words are true. Um, it's... it's um, an exciting industry, but you have to, you, you really have to expect um, the constant change, constant re-education, can't rest on your, you know, what you did last year because next year is going to be different. And so to put this in a positive context, the good news about this is, you know, it would have been exciting to be working in uh, Detroit, Michigan in the 1920s. It would have been exciting to be in Hollywood building the first television studios in the 1950s, building personal computers in the 1980s. But here we are in the 2010s, and we're in the web mobile business. 
So at least we could say it's going to be a crazy business, it's going to be a high, high stress business, but at least we could say it's an exciting business. Um, and right now, you know, again, what we're talking about is the web industry challenges for 2016. And you tell me if I'm, if I'm missing anything here, but this is to me what a user expects from a website. Blazingly fast. You, you can't be, if you're slow, you lost your users, okay? Um, adaptable to any device, from your phone to the biggest television screen in, that you can possibly imagine. And that doesn't only mean that the, um, the screen is different, but also the method of input is different. If it's a phone, you're touching. If it's a uh, large television, um, you might have a remote control. If it's a desktop computer, you've got a keyboard. So it um, has to be automatically personalized with social media hooks. Um, now, a lot of websites aren't, but I really can't think of any good reason. If they're not automatically, if they don't automatically recognize you with uh, your Facebook login, for instance, it's probably because they don't have the capability to do it. Um, and uh, users want it. Users, users want the option to log in with Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, for instance. Um, connected to all the data in the world. Why not? It's there. We're here. Connect it. Um, Push-pull. So this is something rather new. Um, we are expecting that any web experience that we have has the capability to notify us of things that happen that we did not necessarily request. Um, you know, that whether it's just coming up with a little number one on your, on your phone when a new message comes in, that's an example of a notification. But um, it's, it's no longer the case that a website is a passive thing that just sits there until you request. It has to be able to initiate an action with you. 100% um, uptime. And, you know, strangely, we actually sometimes manage to do 100% uptime. But if you have less than 99.9% .9 uptime, you're in trouble. I mean, we are, we are allowed to crash, but we better recover real, quiet, real fast. Um, and finally, attractive and simple call to action UX. And when I say, are you familiar with the term call to action? You know, that it's, uh, wh whenever we're, we're discussing the design for a new website, somebody will always say, you know, remember the call to action. You should never present a user with a, a page where they don't know where they're supposed to go next. So um, we... It, it's very, you could say, fashionable right now or trendy right now to have your websites really guide you from one experience to another because you want to retain your users. So you want to always be putting actions in their face. Okay? So that was what a user expects. Now let's talk about what your manager expects of you or what you expect if you are the manager, or what your company expects from you, whoever you're, what your client expects from you, okay? Um, a web mobile experience pretty much must be model view controller architecture. Who knows what that is? You, can you, you want to describe it? Sure, uh, so the model is, uh, is whatever uh, exists on the back end, like, like the actual reality of how your computer and logic are handling things. Mm -hmm. you know, Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I would. Uh, I mean, the, the two things I would add is for model, I would say the word data. Your model is where your data lives, and your controller is your business logic, your business rules. Um, but yes, very good. So, um, the, really, every architecture, every framework has to address the question: Are you an MVC architecture? And if you're a computer science person, you know this is this is crucial. Um, so really, every stack we've talked about, even going back to my old Perl stack, um, was a model view controller architecture. Um, and going along with that, really si similar thing, data is your model, presentation is your view, business logic is your controller. It's a simple way of putting it, but, but um, that's basically the point is to have separation so that you can have one team implementing your design, another team worrying about what the business rules are, another team manipulating the data in, in whatever way. They, they need to be separate but work together. Um, secure identity management. Um, I mentioned the Facebook login. Many, many sites allow you to log in to, to the site itself. If you're running a WordPress or Drupal site, you don't need to use a Facebook login. You've got a Drupal login or a WordPress login, 
but um, you may optionally allow a Facebook login. Um, either way, it's identity management, and your identity gives you levels of privilege on the site. One user identified as their user is probably the admin. They have ultimate access to the site. Other users are editors, or other users are authors. Maybe an author can contribute, but can't push to production. Um, whereas an editor can contribute and can also push to production, can make an article go live. So that's identity management. Um, you better have clean and compliant code. Um, and as somebody who's been in this business for about 20 years, I can definitely say code quality has gotten much better. 20 years ago, it was uh, horrible. Um, very, very little enforcement by the community of quality rules. Um, at this point, I would say as a Drupal developer, if I were to show somebody code where I'm not indenting two spaces for every indent, I mean, I'll be killed. You, yeah, always, two space indent. Um, very firm rules, and this is a good thing. So, and when I say compliant, you know, basically compliant to whatever standards your team agrees upon. Um, Team-oriented dev environment using Git. I assume, is everybody familiar? Good. Um, programmatic testing. This really is an exciting new trend. Five years ago, we really didn't have powerful testing tools, which meant we couldn't confidently push a development system to production and feel confident that it's not going to break you know, to, to the actual users. So testing is um, a new trend that CMSs have to adapt to. And then finally, continuous integration from staging server to production. Um, really, testing is a part of that. You've got to be able to develop routines that define how something goes live. So this is all what, you know, if we go back to this page again, this is what users expect. This is what your team expects, your development team. Um, and these are the challenges. So now, finally, um, how we got here. So here, a little history, um, just for the fun of it. Um, I mentioned before, when I, when I was doing CGI bin way back, basically HTML was flat files. We actually would um, open up VI Editor and you know, type in our HTML and go live with it. And that's how we did it. Um, by about 1996, we would have a SQL database and um, store our content in the SQL database, a preliminary content management system. So really, the first thing we're seeing here is the CMS. This, what I'm saying for 1996 is the birth of the CMS means there's a SQL Server, which could be MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, that contains your content, and then you've got a set of templates that define how that content is represented as HTML, okay? 1998, I think, was the year that XML, at least was the, the year that XML happened. It was probably invented a couple of years before, but all of a sudden, um, everybody was representing data using an HTML-like syntax. A lot of people don't know that HTML came first, XML was developed after. Um, but you know, basically, it meant that you could start storing data in the same format, that, in a universal format that could be widely understood on the internet. So now we're starting, around here, we're starting to use the internet as a data transmission platform. 2004, Ajax, gigantic change, and the, the birth of JavaScript, really, as a programmer's tool. Before 2004, JavaScript existed, but it was mainly used for annoying ads. And everybody hated JavaScript before 2004. Suddenly, um, Google invented Gmail and Google Maps. Um, and these, these are always talked about as the two key Ajax applications that really changed the world. And all of a sudden, everybody said, hey, wait a minute, I better learn JavaScript. <laughs> because JavaScript is actually the only language that allows you to interact with the page um, without a full page load, which is what Ajax is all about. It means that, you know, basically, there's an operation that is taking place that does not involve the web server pushing an entirely new page, but rather a micro operation. Like when, you, when you're on Gmail, you open up one Gmail, you're not doing a full page load. So that's Ajax. Um, and Another gigantic change was the invention of the iPhone, which um, really changed the paradigm of how people use websites. Because um, 
it, it forced developers and website designers to become much more simple. You, you can't have this much information, you know, that you, you can't have an encyclopedic levels of information on a page, it's just not gonna look good on a phone. And more and more people, by the way, there, a study just went out that um, one in 10 users right now don't, are, are high, inter, high level internet users, they're you know, constantly on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, they don't own computers, they only use their phone. So this is, this is really something new, but as developers or as UX designers, we have to consider this. If we're, if we're designing websites and not thinking how it's gonna look on a phone, we're, we're missing our users, we're missing what they need. Um, so these two are about user experience. Now we're gonna talk a little about backend cloud computing. Um, it used to be a disk was something that was on your server rack. You know, you're, if you're running a web server, there's a room you go to where all your computers are there and the entire website is mounted on the rack. From, you know, basically, if somebody were to pull the plug, the whole thing would go down. Now we have a distributed architecture, mainly AWS is, is the key to that, um, but there are d the, the ecosystem of cloud computing is just gigantic right now and constantly changing, but it does mean from a developer's point of view, things are more complicated than they were. Because when, you're, when all your storage was in the server, which is next door to your office, it, it was just a little easier to conceptualize where your stuff is stored. Now your stuff is stored in the cloud. Um, now here I'm saying 2009 social media, um, this was the year that all of a sudden every website suddenly realized they need Facebook hooks and they need Twitter hooks. Facebook of course existed around 2001, I think, 2002. If you were a Harvard student, you could get Facebook in 2001. Um, but it was 2009 where suddenly it became a challenge that every web developer had to answer, is how are we going to integrate with social media, okay? Um, server virtualization. Curious, does anyone know what I mean by that? Um, Heroku is a good example of it, yeah. Um, I mean, more, more generally though, Heroku is an example of that. Uh, I mean, basically what it means is it used to be that a server was a physical thing. You would actually run your stuff on a physical server. And now we have virtual servers that um, don't care what hardware we're running on. It, it, it used to be that if I were developing a website, I would have to say, well, am I running on a, you know, on an IBM Blade, or am I running on a Dell, or, you know, it, it, there, were, there was actually a physical element to a server. Um, now that servers are virtualized, it gives a whole lot more capability. For instance, you can, you can distribute a web service uh, around the world by actually taking the actual server image and actually distributing it. So this is a good thing. But every time there's a advance in capability, it also means there's an advance in expectations. Used to be, you know, I mentioned earlier 100% uptime. Without server virtualization, there was no 100% uptime because when your server crashed, your server crashed. <laughs> now servers are virtual. You have no excuse for your server to crash. So good things that happen come with higher expectations. And again, you know, that's why again, we talk about web industry challenges it's a good thing, but it's also a challenge. Um, 2011, HTML5 and jQuery, to me the purpose of um, HTML5 was basically to allow the, the types of user experiences that users always wanted. And again, you could say it was defined by the phone, by the iPhone, that um, websites became more visual more component-based. Um, there, there began to develop a logical structure to what a website is that is actually implemented in HTML. Um, so this was a big change and around this time also jQuery, the, really the, the plain vanilla JavaScript framework became a necessary part of web development. Um, and then finally, the, the last challenge, I, I, um, and, and opportunity, Git. Before Git, we used something called SVN. Did anybody here ever use SVN? Okay. <laughs> um, SVN was a lot less distributed than Git. Git is 
it um, enables collaboration to a greater degree, again, it's a good thing, but it also means it's, it's a challenge because it's something we as developers have to now reach a higher level of interaction because we can interact in, in a more thorough way. So, um, any questions about any of this? Okay, so um, this to me represents the, um, the, the reason that the old paradigms of web development, like LAMP, like Drupal, like WordPress, just aren't cutting it anymore. Why do we need Node.js? Why do we need Mongo? And um, I think it's because the old paradigms were struggling to meet yeah, these needs. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to say that mean is, is perfect. I am very enthusiastic about it right now. But, um, you know, having, having immersed myself in it for, for the last couple of months, um, I have discovered that it, it can be a, as problematic and as difficult as any other framework. However, it is a framework that's built for the challenges of today. Um, so I'm not saying mean is great because it's just so good. I'm saying it's great because it's the tool that addresses the problems that we need to, to solve. And you know, as I said before, four powerful components, Mongo, Express, um, Angular, and Node, and one powerful ecosystem when you put them together. So now I'd like to just go into um, the details of each of these, and I'm curious, how, how much do you guys know about, like, about Node? Did, you know, okay. Did everybody here know about non-blocking I.O.? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to go real quickly through this and just, um, but basically before Node, Apache was really the only choice. I mean, if you're on Microsoft, you could use IIS, but um, pretty much you're using Apache or, or um, you know, something very much like Apache. And this is one process that handles many requests. And when Apache is talking to a client, and it may be talking to 100,000 or a million clients at once, it's actually consuming resources on the server for each of those. Um, now, of course, there are caching systems. So, you know, it's not as simple as there's one Apache process. But Apache is one process at the center of everything. And that's, that's a tough architecture to scale. Okay? That's the problem that Node was designed to solve. How can you go from a big foot footprint monolith architecture to a small footprint dynamic architecture where instead of one server that sits there and may, may run for a year, you know, if your server doesn't crash, your Apache may run for a year, may run for 10 years and, and never stop running gathering memory, you know, hoping that garbage collection is kicking in and, and you know, eventually your, your server will crash and you'll, you'll have to restart Apache. But um, with Node, each server just pops up when it's needed, disappears when it's done. And it's, an, you know, really once, once this was invented, I think a lot of people in the industry were like, why didn't we think of this 10 years ago? Because really, there's nothing stopping us from thinking of this 10 years ago. Does anyone know why Node was invented? What was the actual challenge that caused um, Ryan Dahl to invent it? Does anyone know? Um, it was a progress bar. So imagine you're on Netflix, and you're downloading your movie. And you want a progress bar that, that says, you know, it's downloading from here to here. Okay? It, very, very difficult with Apache, because Apache likes to deliver complete pages. Okay, so this guy named Ryan Dahl, um, if, you, if, you, if you haven't done it, Google him, look at some of his videos. He's a very humble, quiet guy, but he's the guy who invented Node. Um, and he said, how am I going to do a progress bar? I guess I'll have to write a JavaScript server system. And <laughs> <laughs> that's really how Node was invented. Um, so the type of operation that is a progress bar is an Ajax type of operation. So it's not that he could not have done it, but it would have been extremely inefficient um, because every time a Apache delivers an HTTP response, it does a lot of work. It reads your cookies. It, you know, it initiates a, a 
a, basically a session for you. If, if a session isn't already active, or it checks if a session is active, and if it's not, initiates a new session. Node was like, we're not going to do any of that. We're just, we're going to make this as simple as possible. We're going to listen on a port, take an input, respond, and then we're going to die, disappear. And um, so instead of, again, one big server that just sits there, lots of little servers that pop up and disappear. Scalable, high performance. So, um, so basically, if, if Node had not been invented, a lot of the actual experiences that y we're all familiar with, like progress bars, really would have been very problematic. We'd probably be throwing more hardware at it. You know, we'd probably have twice as many physical servers just to keep up with the fact that Apache is inefficient. Luckily, of course, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. Find a software solution. So, um, I think this, the, the main point, I think you already know most of this, but um, I really want to just make sure we focus on the concept of a callback, that the real innovation here is that, let's say you are a node server, and you're going to write... Um, let's say a 30 second video to a port. You're just going to send that to the user. Okay? What you, would, what you will do is send it out, register a callback function that says when this operation is complete, this function will, will be invoked and then you die. You disappear. So you're no longer consuming resources. And then the callback function when, when the 30 second video is actually delivered, um, a new server, a new node server will pop up to run that callback function. And that is the basic architecture of node. Okay? So that's the magic that makes it possible. Is that clear? Then? Okay. Has, have you all used Express? Okay, so I, th I think you, you basically know this, but um, whereas Node is a very innovative architecture, Node is nothing like Apache, um, Express is actually really just does this, the, the typical things that a web server does. It, um, it basically you know, does, handles everything that, that web servers used to handle. So um, when I look at the mean stack, you know, I, I, I typically don't pay a whole lot of attention to Express because it's very familiar. To any web developer, um, what Express does is fairly familiar, whereas what Node does is very innovative. But basically, this is the work that, uh, that Express is doing. We're still dealing with cookies. Um, for performance reasons, we're still, we, we better be dealing with caching. Um, and it would be at the, yeah. Okay, so you know this. Okay, got it. Good, yeah, because actually there's a lot to go for here. Okay, um, and same with Mongo. Familiar? Okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> wait, which one? This one? <laughs> okay. Because you're all doing Angular 1, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we got rid of the controller. Um, the component is everything. And the component basically represents, um, the, the way I like to think of it is, you know, a component is typically associated with a selector. Um, and it represents whatever action is taking place on that, in that web experience. Or, you know, I, I like to say experience rather than page, but it, some part of that web page is a user experience component, and the software corollary to that is the Angular component. It encapsulates all the logic, it encapsulates the template, um, it identifies the selector, and it basically handles everything for, us, for an operation. So again, let, you know, let's talk about Netflix. I think Netflix is it's a good example because a lot of that does take place with Node. So again, if you're downloading a video, um, that is a good example of a component. The actual download process is a component. Uh, everything about that from the presentation to the business logic to the HTML selector that is used to um, place it on the page is all actually coded as a component. Okay? And I think in Angular 1, I'm not that familiar with Angular 1, I think in Angular 1 you, you do have components but 
it's not quite as um, complete an implementation. It's yeah. Okay. And also another great thing about um, Angular 2, of course, is TypeScript. Um, basically, object-oriented JavaScript is the way I like to think of it. Um, the prop. Is say that again. Um, I, b I believe you have to. I think you definitely be no, you don't have to. But True, true, yeah. But it's written in, Angular 2 is written in, <coughs> in TypeScript, so the Angular team themselves uses TypeScript. And so, but you don't, you don't have to. Uh, <coughs> That's correct, yeah. It's a good point that it's, it compiles down to JavaScript, so you can actually read the JavaScript that you're. But um, I, I have been teaching myself all of these things by following tutorials. Um, you know, same thing really anybody does when, when transitioning to Angular, and every tutorial assumes TypeScript. Um, so I, I would say it's pretty universal, and you may as well go ahead with it. What's the big difference? Does TypeScript introduce like full-on classes? Or yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's basically a standard object-oriented. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah. Also, sometimes some some people like to use the ES6 extension um, rather than it's the TS exactly extension. ES6. Yeah. And this, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but um, you know what I say here it is the only web framework that allows a single language to transcend client and server. So why is that? Why is it the only one? Because it's the only one in the browser. Correct. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like you, you very rarely get to use the word only in the software world because somebody else will always do it. But this is a case where you can actually use the word only unless somebody, uh, unless some organization creates a browser that does not jo do JavaScript, and I really can't think of an example of that. Why then, that? say that again. I don't know if that's what's happening. Why hasn't any company built a browser that will interpret uh, another speaking language like uh, Python? Yeah. Because well, for people, yeah, people, people do try doing that, but the, it, it takes a lot to get all the browser vendors to accept you know, like you know any any one thing and. and and honestly, like JavaScript itself is so baked in yeah. that it's that it's not like there's something so wrong with just uh, you, and you know JavaScript itself runs on so many older browsers like like let's say there's like a, like your BlackBerry phone has a browser that also runs JavaScript right so you can't you can't reinvent like every browser in the world and so it's pretty much right. it's become like the English language like it's very hard to even though the English language is very hard to learn and it's like not probably the most scientifically designed language. It's just that everybody speaks it. And so, you know, it becomes like the, the standard language. Yeah. Because what what would this browser do if it can't consume JavaScript web pages? You know, the whole idea of the web is to share. So, you know, as you said, it's it's you have to have the commonality. But so what's happening is things like TypeScript, you know, that's that's what's happening because yeah, like so JavaScript is becoming like the assembly language of the web that higher level languages can then compile down to. Um, but it's very hard for me to imagine that anytime soon, you know, JavaScript will be replaced as the default language of browser. Also, is there a trend. need? Is there any problem that yeah, would like, be solved by like that? The fact that ES6, ES7, like the whole you know, ECMAScript committee is fixing JavaScript so quickly now that it's almost like, you know, people used to hate ES5 because they had so many issues with it, but then you know, things, are, things are getting better. Yeah. 
Also, you know, JavaScript's a real good language. Um, it's, it was based on C, um, which is not a bad thing to base a language on. It's, you know, the syntax is just crystal clear. I don't, never seen anybody look at JavaScript and say, I don't understand what this is doing. It's, it's right there. And, I mean, you may not understand what the logic is doing, but you, you understand what, it, what an if is, and what an else is, and what a var is. It really can't, can't think of how it could be cleaner, except you need object-oriented structures, you need classes. Why don't you talk a little bit about, I think instead of going over the mean side, why don't you talk a little bit more about your experience with CRMs and specifically CMSs, you mean? That, sorry, that Actually, that's what the CMSs, next, yeah. yeah. And then Keystone and like what, sure. what things you learned. I think that's the next slide. So, um, this is now, let's say we are either case study one or case study two. We're either a small business operation, you know, maybe a team of one or two or three people developing a website for a client who's got reasonable expectations. Um, and they want to have articles, they want to have videos, they want to have images, slideshows, carousels, um, music maybe. They want to have catalog-driven commerce, which means not only can you do a commerce transaction, but you have a nice presentation of an entire product catalog, which is a real good case for CMS. You know, think of Amazon as the, the biggest catalog in the world. Um, so, you know, let's say we have a, a, a small catalog, and this is the site we want to build. And then let's take case study two, um, a team of 100 people and we are going to collaborate on a website that's going to try to reach a mass audience, okay? So I'm sort of, you know, doing that, trying to do the um, small and big at, at the same time. And in both cases, we need a CMS, a content management system. Um, and the question is, should we do it? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the elements of a CMS are a database, as you said, um, traditionally SQL. Now, with, with the new world, it can also be Mongo or any other NoSQL. Um, and a templating system, which I think you're already familiar with, with templates. Um, and basically a middleware layer where whatever logic you need to implement, um, let's say rules of access, things like that, um, are, are implemented. And the, what, a, what a CMS does is basically serve the website. It takes in the request, it manages the URL space, um, and it, it basically sits on top of Apache and, and actually serves your web pages. So um, one good example, uh, uh, my CMS of choice, as I've said, has been Drupal. More people are familiar with WordPress because WordPress is a little smaller, a little closer to um, consumer market, but uh, the whole federal government runs on Drupal. Meaning, I don't mean the operations like the IRS, but all of their public facing websites. Um, and that's because in, in 2009, when Barack Obama was elected, they said, well, we're not going to you know, use the old architecture, we're going to do something new. Asked around, what is the best site? What, what is the best CMS? And the answer was Google. Um, totally open source, and I, so I actually spent the last six years living in Washington, D.C., working, I um, did a product for, project for Department of Labor, U.S. Post Office, Center for Disease Control, um, all of these are federal government departments which have all used Drupal because of a, a directive came, came down that, that we want to standardize on this. Um, so if you want to see a good Drupal site, go to whitehouse.gov. That's kind of the uh, you know flagship Drupal site, um, it's, and it it is um, you know gigantically popular all over the world. The Drupal community is just I can't even describe how big it is. Much bigger at this point than the than the um, Node community, um, probably equal to the WordPress community. But um, 
And so what I'm going to be doing here is contrasting the, the way I would have done a project like either of these a year ago would have been to choose Drupal. Now I'm asking the question, would I choose Node instead? Would I choose a mean stack instead? Um, so even though I'm saying this, I'm, I'm not actually trying to discourage anybody from experiencing Drupal. Drupal is, is real cool. It's real good. Um, but it, it may be, the question I'm asking is, is, is Drupal still the web platform for the future? And that's what we'll discuss. So here are the things we'll consider, and I would like to know if I'm missing anything. I'm, sh I'm sure I am. There's plenty of things to discuss here, but um, we're going to talk about performance and scalability. So for a case study, too, I said we're going for a BuzzFeed type of, type of um, content management system, which means we should expect that anything we publish will be widely shared on Facebook and may get a gigantic traffic spike. Mark, so we actually don't have that much time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sure. Okay. What do you see are the benefits of using? Okay, sure. Okay, so you. The, um, yeah, I just. Think this is a good thing to introduce. Okay. I mean, basically, if I were implementing Drupal in Node, I would, I would have come up with Keystone. It's a, it's a very familiar standard implementation of the CMS paradigm. What makes it unique is that it's Node is that it's mean. It's the database is not MySQL, the database is Mongo. Um, and it doesn't assume that you're using Apache, it assumes that you're using Node and Express. Okay, so that's what Keystone is. Um, at this point, it's still a small community. Um, really, I'm really surprised because I'm, I've become very excited about Keystone and started interacting with some of the people who are around it, and it kind of reminds me of where Drupal was 10 years ago, or where WordPress was 10 years ago, and I think that's a good thing. It means we can, we can all get in on the ground floor if we want, and we don't always have that opportunity for something as cool as this. Um, and one thing I want to mention, I am talking about mean, but Keystone is not really mean because it does not in any way um, in, interact with Angular. It's up to you as the developer to, to put the Angular in there. Um, it's, it's basically the back-end framework that allows you to develop a mean application. Um, so now, actually, each of these things that we talked about, I'm just going to do one slide for each of them, each of these considerations. So, um, and I'm picking a winner here. The winner is going to be either mean or lamp in each, in each of these cases, and then we'll see how we end up. So performance and scalability, probably not a big shock con considering what we were talking about about non-blocking I.O. Um, it's the winner. Mi JavaScript is, um, with, with the Google V8 engine, has been benchmarked against PHP and definitely wins. Um, because Node is su such a minimal architecture where Apache is a maximal architecture, um, it, it's more scalable. And, um, and that makes a big difference. Again, you know, think about the BuzzFeed type of application, because it's really important to think about that you could get a traffic spike at any moment, and you have to be able to handle that. Um, so that's where Node may become crucial, okay, because, because it's scalable. Um, and we already talked about the non-blocking I.O. method. And this, you know, it, whether this point that JSON is code not really sure how much of a difference that makes in terms of performance, but it's a nice, it's a nice fact that when you're dealing with a MySQL data set, you're not dealing with a code in a language, JavaScript, object notation, JSON. It actually is code. Your, your data is code. So you know, from an old school CMS guy, that's real exciting. Um, and I wish I you know, could, could have a MySQL server that delivers data in PHP. But it doesn't. It delivers data, actually, as structured data that your PHP program has to digest and process, and that takes time. So with this architecture, it's already code. Okay? Um, and so that's why for performance and scalability, the winner is mean. Oh, and uh, this caveat important. This, this slide would be very simplistic, criminally simplistic, if I didn't say that Choosing the right tool does not give you performance. Only good engineering gives you performance. And you can get amazing, engineer, amazing performance out of any language if you do it right. Um, 
So real quickly, you know, I, I think it is our responsibility as web developers to think of worst case scenarios. We have to think about data loss. The worst thing you could ever do is, you know, even worse than crashing is losing data. Okay, um, being hacked, having something embarrassing go up. You know, when, when the White House chose Drupal, they were trusting that Drupal would be secure. And that was nearly eight years ago. There has not been a major hacking incident, so I think, they, I think it turned out to be a good bet. Um, but you really have to, have to um, feel strong confidence in the platform you chose. And um, I do want to make the point that JavaScript does not, in the industry, have a reputation or a tradition of, of great security. That doesn't mean that there are known security leaks that aren't being addressed. But um, in order to have the level of security confidence that would allow, say, the federal government to choose you as their platform, you've got to be so bulletproof. So Drupal has done that. So if we were making this choice, um, I would, just on that alone, I'm giving for this one the winner to LAMP. Um, you're, you're taking a risk with, with worst case scenarios if, if you do not choose a well-tested platform, okay? User experience. Um, again, the iPhone, the fact that once, once people began using the iPhone to access the web, um, it really changed everybody's notion of what a user experience is. The old tools were not built for that. They had to um, sort of uh, run circles around their own capabilities in order to deliver very dynamic, very component-driven user experiences. Mean is built for those user experiences. So um, I'm giving the winner to Mean here. Um, it's, the whole, it's really the whole point of Angular. It's really the whole point of Node. You know, again, the progress bar. Very difficult um, without Mean. It's a lot easier with Mean. So that's, so far, two to one. Code quality and dev tools, I mentioned before, um, as a, as a, you know, real, I'm a member of the Drupal community. I'm proud to be a member of the Drupal community. We are proud of our code quality. I'm not, qu I'm not sure yet if the JavaScript community would say that, you know. Um, and, and one reason is that um, with Drupal, we contribute code back to Drupal. And it better be completely standard compliant if you're contributing it back. Um, so I think that as the mean community matures, this will, this will have to happen, but I'm not sure it has happened yet. However, this is a close call because while I'm, I'm giving this one to, um, to LAMP, NPM has had such an impact on web developers. You know, it's, it is Node Package Manager, but it's probably the most popular thing Node has done is NPM. People use NPM who aren't using Node. Um, so that also, that's actually um, a reason why I'm, I'm saying this is a close call, okay? Um, the reason that I'm still giving this to LAMP is because Drupal has adopted Composer, which is its version of NPM. But if it were not for NPM, people probably would not not know that they need a package manager. We used to just do it by hand. We used to just, you know, upgrade stuff and, and hope it worked. Um, so, so NPM has really been a great boost to the industry. Um, so here what I'm talking about is available capabilities. Which one has the, all of the tools that you're going to need to build your website? Um, so it, when I say Drupal here, by the way, you could really replace it with the word WordPress. Um, in either case, the user community has been so enthusiastic and so productive that you've got a world of available modules that you can plug in. And I think this is where um, the, the Node community is just not mature yet. It'll get there, but it's not quite there yet. So, um, you know, for instance, with, with Drupal, there's something called views. It's a, a way of basically slicing and dicing your data. So I mentioned before, let's say we're building a catalog system for a commerce site. You would be using views to um, have a programmatic way of getting at your data without writing a lot of database queries. Okay, I, you know, I looked for something com comparable to that with in the, the node stack, and I have not found it yet. So I think in this case, um, we're going to have to give the winner to LAMP. So now it's two to, two to me and three to LAMP, and um, human ecosystem. So I would say, based on my perceptions, people are really excited about node right now. Um, 
I, I, actually, the first time I heard of Node, I was talking to a really, really smart guy I know, one of the best developers I know. And I just you know, asked him, hey, I'm just curious, what do you think is the hottest thing right now? And this, this was about five years ago. He said, Node.js. Never heard of it. And I was like, what's that? But the fact that he said it, um, you know, you, you kind of know, know, sometimes when you just hear somebody drop the word, they're not going to mention it unless it's really cool. Node is developing that kind of enthusiasm right now. And to me, that means that um, if you want to attract the best developers, you really want to attract them with the platform that, that they're going to be excited to use. So um, that's one reason. The, the other reason, and I, I also I, I, um, enjoyed watching a video of Ryan Dahl, the guy who in, invented Node. And somebody asked him, this was him being interviewed on stage, why did you choose um, to implement Node in JavaScript? He said, because we all know it. Because we're we're all job. We, if you're a web developer, you are a job. <laughs> excuse me, a JavaScript developer. It's really the only language. Some people use Java. Some people use PHP. Some people use, you know, VB. Um, but everybody uses JavaScript. So, um, for the human ecosystem, I'm giving the win to Mean, and that means it's three and three. And here's my conclusion. It is a tough call. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to play it real safe and say the smaller project can have a higher risk. And I'll, so, you know, really, it's all for fun, but my answer is um, I would not commit myself to Node for a massively distributed, um, you know, 100 person team at this point. Not ready yet. Um, but I would choose it for the smaller project. Probably have to work harder, but I would get a much better product out of it. So that's my answer for right now, March 2016. But the um, reason I'm here and the reason I'm excited about this is because um, all, the, all the drawbacks that we just mentioned about the mean side are drawbacks that will be addressed. Every single one of those limitations will be addressed. They'll, they will have better co code quality. We will develop more modules. You know? So to me, it's, uh, the um, winner for right now is a toss-up. The winner for the future is mean. And I think that was my last slide. Any questions? Yeah, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Isn't uh, WordPress switching over to Node?